You've reached Hotel Pacifico, your five-star destination for BC Politicos. Press 4 for room service. Press the star key for your hosts, Mike McDonald and Kate Hammer. Welcome back, guests. Thanks for joining us again for early check-in at Hotel Pacifico. Good to see you, Mike and Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We've got another special guest today. Checking in from out of town. Welcome, Corey, tonight. He's actually in town. Hey, yeah. I'm in well, Vancouver. Beautiful Vancouver. Yeah. That's when you stay at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, it's great to have you, Corey. Um, you know, in particular, just been thinking of you because, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about what this moment in BC means for conservative strategists, you know, looking at um, the future of the conservative movement in Canada. Uh, I'm curious, just like standing back and watching what's been going on in BC, what, what are you taking away? Well, because this is a curse of politics uh, crossover, I, I have to you know respond appropriately and say it's fucking great <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the the politics here is so interesting like i think it's one of the you know i think bc politics has always been being fascinating it's got a level of complexity that i think uh you know perhaps save quebec more than any other uh, province in in the country and uh and and once again it's 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 demonstrating why it's you know the amount of dynamicism that you you see <laughs> Uh, okay. in, in the political market here is is not found most places like uh you know the uh, ups and downs of uh, bc united to like the downs to the point of being gone and uh the rapid rise of the bc conservatives um uh okay. i i think on the ndp side like uh the ndp here has got major gain and always has and so uh yeah i uh, i love it love it I have to do a follow up if I make it. So Corey yeah, was go. challenging BC United to die with dignity on a scale of zero to ten. <laughs> on a scale of zero to ten, how did they do? Um, <laughs> how much dignity you know, was it? Uh, you know, zero being, you know, your corpse dragged through the streets behind uh, behind a chariot, <laughs> <laughs> and and ten being a respectful funeral. I'll, I'll give them about a four. <laughs> it's uh, that's generous. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it uh, yeah, it it, it was uh, ultimately a, a made sort of action, but uh, you know, uh, done after <laughs> done after a lot of indignities were suffered. <laughs> oh man! Well, we're glad to have you uh, here today. You know, air quotes is in house fire breathing conservative. Uh, I'm not <laughs> sure a lot of. I, I'm actually not sure a lot of BC United considered as made situation. I'm not sure that they gave their consent. So um, that's true. Oh wow! Yeah. That's, that, that, that's actually more true than yeah. God, to be honest. But so, um, yeah. it was more like a pillow being, you know, yeah. Ooh, yeah. It's a bit more of a murder. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a yeah. Gentle easing well, into the night. We're in maybe. BC. It's probably a gigantic uh, syringe of opioids, but it's. Uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Okay. That's probably, that's probably too far. Anyway. Okay, let's start uh, the yeah, show. <laughs> I know we were testing where that bar that line was and we just found it. Okay. Well, you know, it's always easiest to see it from the other side of the line, you know, so we're we're well over and, <laughs> well and it's being clearly found. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, and and yeah, we will we will come back to that topic and others. Uh we just have a touch of a listener feedback we want to touch on. Um, you know, and a lot of uh, a lot of great feedback actually on the daily uh episodes, which I'm grateful for because I feel like it justifies uh, the early minings. I don't know, Mike and Jeff, if I speak for you, Jeff would be up anyway, I guess, but Mike and I <laughs> appreciate the feedback. Well, you know, I like what Maddie says. Oh, I thought it was funny on the rust dad rebate. Maddie says the rebate's pretty simple, Jeff. I added that in, uh, you can, <laughs> you can write off $1,500 a month from rent mortgage off BC income tax. Pretty simple dummies. Yeah, okay. so. Ping, I can see the stardust flying. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we also have one from Abe who says, thanks for doing this podcast. This is going to be my morning coffee substitute for the next few weeks. So thanks, everyone, for your comments that we get on YouTube and other places. And if you have any negative comments, please send them by mail to Rural Route 7, Post Office Box 90210, Kingfisher, BC. Okay. And we'll be sure to answer your mail within three to six months. Can I, can I make a, a quick prediction? I think by I think by the end of the campaign, you guys are going to be the number one political podcast in uh, in Canada. You know, uh, when going daily, 
really drives ratings. And uh, we don't and care about like, the ratings, Corey. We okay. are quality not based our motivation. podcast. <laughs> uh, okay. We don't well, care yeah. about the money either. Yeah. We do yeah. it for you, the you, yeah. you Easterners, it's all about the <laughs> it's all about the numbers. It's I was a, saying here, I was saying saying to, saying to Hurley at uh, dinner last night. We were out with uh, Dmitry Panizopoulos and uh, Brooke Piggott, uh, two two of my other favorite people out here. And uh, I was saying, well, you know, you're red and I'm blue and like we'd like all these colors, but my favorite color is green. So, you know, if you're not caring about the, about the money and the ratings, then, you know. Uh... OK, <laughs> duly noted Bay Street. Yeah. 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 Is there a pay equity issue between our between our podcast? We might need to talk about this more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This is great. Well, um, no, and I know you've done it before. And actually, I have to say, Corey, I really enjoyed listening to The Curse uh, and going daily. And it's part of what keeps me going here every morning at Hotel Pacifico. Stick All around, right. Corey, because, yeah, you just so you know, we do the espresso bar here instead of the uh, instead of the mini bar. So um, you said they had a few shots of espresso. I know. He, um, he wait, said, well, full throttle. So, so okay. what are the leaders doing today? Yeah, exactly. So the leaders are David E.B., uh, is moving about in Vancouver Island today, uh, starting in Cumberland with an announcement, I think pretty shortly, actually, 8.30 this morning. Sonia First now is staying close to home, I think, in her, near her HQ. Uh, John Rastad is in Vancouver hosting a meet and greet with Vancouver, Yale, Town Canada, Melissa DeGenova, uh, and I think headed to the Fraser Valley over the weekend, uh, which makes a lot of sense. So we'll be tracking, we'll be checking in with you guests uh, next week on that. But just to say, we won't have an episode on Monday. We will all be marking uh, uh, the Day of Truth, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day, um, but we will see you on Tuesday. Um, We'll talk more about that in a minute, but let's also, let's do the reflective thing. Let's look back on Thursday because Thursday was another, another interesting day with a bit more of back and forth. Um, I'll start with mining. Um, I think there was a bit more just consensus on that. The conservative announcement on mining and the NDP announcement, both just talking about faster permitting really, um, and then slightly different approaches behind that. Um, well received by industry, less well received by conservationists. I don't know, like I didn't see it lead any of the new cast or make a lot of permeation i don't know uh jeff no, if you saw too much on air mike yeah pretty quiet i agree it was eons ago like in the 70s and 80s mining was one of the huge sticks that the ndp was beaten with but in my view of course it would be my view but i think uh it's obvious in the lack of interest in this that generally speaking that industry has been pretty satisfied with the way things are going they've made some great deals based on reconciliation principles and so on and a lot of properties are going forward so this will help um yeah, did that one uh, I looked for and found, but it was hard to see. Yeah, so easier to see, or maybe thanks to some good photography. And this was at the Teamsters announcement about uh, trades and apprenticeships with David Eby. Is the B? Yeah. <laughs> I'm worried amazing, this is where we have to go. Amazing now. photo. <laughs> uh, well, people you haven't know, seen it of the B just about to arrive and distinct David Eby. Uh, I tried uh, to, yeah. Well, I got I, I got to say, you know, I would be not doing my job if I didn't do a, a Ford comparison uh, in yeah. terms of the uh, the bee eating. Uh, I think Ford did it better, but uh, that's just me. In so terms Doug Ford of, ate the bee. He ate the bee. <laughs> he swallowed but, the bee, right? Yeah. That, yeah, the, the little sucker was really buzzing around in there, uh, as uh, as I think you pointed out. But um but i you know i also you know i was going to say uh, you know had i been on a few weeks ago after the carbon tax reversal and all that if there's one more policy reversal by david eby i'm going to start calling him doug ford <laughs> 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 well okay but, uh, sorry you, policy you, to bees that's you, right you, you've hit on one of my favorite topics though Corey. can well, we, we led about... with the tunnel yeah sorry we love it no 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 but i just want to say like Corey, like observations and the differences and how uh, Doug Ford does a U-turn and David Eby does a U-turn. Yeah. Uh, they look different. Yeah, they do. They do. Uh, and, and, and I think it, it's, some of it comes back to sort of, you know, what is the basic core of how you communicate with people? Like, I, I think the two politicians who've, who've done reversals like that best have, have always been Ralph Klein and, uh, and sort of the successor to that is, is Doug Ford. Uh, but there is sort of a folksy, you know, uh, every man sort of feel to to uh, how those two uh, politicians communicated and uh, and very much not a, you know, I'm talking down to you or, you know, I'm I'm up here and you're down there. It's like very much more uh, at the level of, of most voters. And and I, I think that gives you more space 
to actually do course corrections uh, without uh, without looking like you're swallowing yourself whole. Uh, you know, and there's also a difference between something that's like a more transactional issue, like, you know, the green belt or something like that, and something that is what I would call a core values uh, issue, like, uh, which is, is, it, is, so, is, is, is sort of transactional. Is it transactional? Well, I, I I think so. Like, you know, what is what is the core value of the green belt? Like, this is sort of a made up thing. Uh, uh, you know, it's a a you know a zoning issue. Like, how how much you know more transactional can something be uh, versus uh, you know having sold the uh, uh, the carbon tax as being basically uh, are you a climate denier or not? Right, which it has has a much more ideological sort of tinge to it. And and the reversal is being done by somebody who, who you know is uh, you know a sort of more lawyerly uh, kind of figure with like a, a a very different vibe than I think uh, uh, than I think someone like Ford has, which is a, like a very more everyman kind of vibe. All right, well, let's tie let's tie that together with one issue that came up yesterday, and um, is that there's a video circulating yeah. um, of a. Uh, kids having ice cream at a Dairy Queen in Port Alberni and just outside the window, there's somebody smoking a crack pipe. And, uh, you know, in terms of policy, you turns, you can tie this to decrim and uh, what's ha what's happening on the streets. And I guess, uh, Kate, I think the question you were going to pose is to what degree does David E.B. You know, own it when it comes um, to these videos, yeah, right? Yeah, and yeah. now he's kind of executed a bit of a, um, bit of a U-turn on that issue. But... Um, as much as the foibles of the conservatives are are showing up in the you know in Twitter and the media, along comes these real life videos that are showing up that are reminding people what they have anxiety about. Yeah, I mean, I, I have kind of um, this is part of why I, I was wondering about this question, like how much does this surfacing? Uh, yesterday, uh, this video, and it's you know it's it's kind of perfect in that it's too adorable young children enjoying their ice cream and then the camera just pans and then behind there's a person who appears to be smoking crack and I think it's uh it's a really strong illustration of something I think people are frustrated with and have seen increasingly like I think a lot of people will say I'm you know and we saw this in the SOS poll we discussed you know the other day that people are seeing more of this and have a feel that it's on the rise um I I, I feel kind of torn though about like how much does this does this come back to David Eby's door, um, and I think for some people there's a bit of a that that decrim lit link is very strong, um, and I think for others um, it's bigger than that, and it's sort of there's an awareness that there's a crisis that is you know actually it actually is you know national and, and international that this isn't sort of unique to the experiment happening and the pilot happening uh right now in vancouver uh jeff i don't know like when you were watching that video did you see um did you see that as something and if we we could probably see more well, it was like a this. particularly stark one and its timing was excellent but anybody in bc could have made such a video with many similar characteristics for the last number of years and that's true in lots of canada the interesting thing about decrim was it was never going to achieve what some harm reduction activists thought it would uh, and uh, it's uh, it's elimination. I would disagree with Mike that it was partly rolled back. It was completely rolled back. Um, has not changed the has not changed it. So the public, if you look at the polling, the research co released earlier this week, the public across the board on a completely bipartisan basis hate decriminalization, but are quite sympathetic, even in surprisingly in conservative circles to a higher degree than I would have expected to a lot of other harm reduction measures, which is why. I think you see in Alberta, um, many harm reduction measures continuing under the direction of people like uh, Daniel Smith, and Marshall Smith, but without the same controversy, because the people believe there, I guess, that there's enough treatment going on or something. Um, so it's a, you know, this was bound to be an issue. Uh, it was not an issue when uh, addicts were dying, but when, um, it, and, and they continue to, uh, but it has become an issue now that it's sort of in people's face. And so what John Rustad is promising to do um, in his very straightforward and simple way is shut down the drug dens, um, eliminate decriminalization and do a bunch of things which are great slogans right now, but are easier to say than to do. That's for sure. So we'll see how it plays out. 
I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering, Corey, like one of the things I was thinking of in watching that, because we've been talking a bit and um, hopefully we'll get to this with you too. Like we were talking a bit about all the videos um, the NDP has been dropping of showing John Ross dad, you know, talking, saying some silly things um, and espousing some some consp conspiracy theories. Uh, and I was watching this thinking, oh, this could be sort of the the version of that that the conservatives have to arm against the NDP because it's not hard <laughs> to find a video right now where you and I say this as sort of an, a parent living in an urban setting like you know for to make a video like that uh, a version of that would not be hard for me right now I think sadly and does this become sort of some of what the conservatives then have to sort of in the same way drip out a like these kind of short video reminders of remember that's what who David Eby is that's what David Eby did for you yeah, I think, well, what would I say about this? Um, I, I think a lot of the thinking around this issue and and approaches and policy for the rest of Canada have really been, been pioneered here in Vancouver. And some for some for better and some for worse. And I, I and I think that continues to be the case. Like I I, I wanna I wanna give some some credit and a big shout out. Uh, to Marshall Smith, who I think, you know, probably more than any elected official has been driving some of the thinking in the policy community around this. And I also want to give a shout out to you, Jeff, because, uh, you know, just in our offline sort of, uh, you know, uh, relationship with people who are involved with Air Quotes Media, you know, you've, 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 you've certainly sent me a lot of like really interesting and really informative and really helpful things in terms of trying to wrap one's head around uh, this very complicated issue. Um, so on the politics of it, yeah, I think I think EB owns it more than others because he's you know been out there and and an advocate in one direction and and uh, and I would say he's also now uh, further on the the reversal of this policy uh, than probably anyone else in 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 the country is uh, in terms of uh, you know mandatory care and. Uh, you know, so like I, I think I think it's a very interesting, you know, topic area, you know, in which everyone has good intent. Like there is nobody out there who's talking around this issue that I think, uh, you know, despite my bad sense of humor off the top of the show, I, I think everybody is is coming at this from a very good place and wanting to do the right thing. And I think struggling with trying to figure it out and. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it, you know, it's it's a very important debate, and it's one that's that, you know, I don't think anyone's got completely figured out. And uh, but on the politics of it today, I think EB probably owns owns the unpopular parts of it more than uh, Rust Ad uh, in terms of this, you know, particular election campaign. Well, Mike, right. do you, Mike? I know we talked a little <laughs> bit about Lisa Lapointe standing with Sonia, Sonia first. You know, like, do you think that point of contrast with the Greens going further is maybe helpful to EB because he sort of? I gets think to it show... probably does help him triangulate on it a bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Guess I'm sure we're going to be talking a fair bit about healthcare this election. That's true of most elections, but a confluence of predictable factors like our aging population and unpredictable ones, like a global pandemic, have put unprecedented strain on our healthcare system. And I want to zoom in on a political bellwether community that is facing unique challenges, Kamloops, because they've been hit by a confluence of challenges, including a 51% increase in homelessness, high rates of fatal overdoses, and pressures on the healthcare system overall. This is why TELUS and Ask Wellness Society have partnered to bring the Ask Wellness Mobile Health Clinic powered by TELUS Health to Kamloops and Merrith with plans to expand to Penticton. The mobile clinic aims to provide primary health care and harm reduction services to people experiencing homelessness in the BC interior and is expected to support over 4,000 patient visits per year. In BC's diverse geography, these clinics on wheels can help bridge the health care gap between urban and rural or remote communities. And they're another example of what it means to be BC's hometown teen. But who wants to hear some new polling numbers? <laughs> oh, Mike always polling. wants to polling. get to Mike I wants to polling. get to his favorite segment, milking the data, brought to you by BC Dairy. Farmers need guaranteed access to water to feed BC. This is where this is where we find, you know, the well, we numbers behind the beat. Today. This is like a special <laughs> dollop of uh you know, strawberry yogurt or other dairy product you might enjoy 
your sour it's cream nice and, and brown sugar. Come on, you nice know, and fresh this morning. That's how you. Do um, <laughs> so we we've been working here with Polaris Strategic Insights, which is a firm I do work with, um, to provide some uh, polling numbers that are going to be heard first here on uh, Hotel Pacifico. And uh, what we've done here is have a rolling track during the campaign of about 200 interviews a night. About half are online and half are IVR. So it's a bit of a mixed methodology system to kind of uh, balance out the quirks in each methodology. The uh, margin of error, oh gosh, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's around 3%. Um, so we're looking at a sample of about 1,000 across the province. Now there's a key distinction here is that these results are weighted for turnout by age. So uh, there's going to be a little bit more older um, voters in the sample than younger. We've been talking about that quite a bit. Yes, Jeff, there's more of you, <laughs> less of Kate. Um, more Jeff, less so Kate. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's a difference with other pollsters. Um, it, it's not a huge difference, but it's a, a marginal difference. And, and I believe it's more reflective of what actually happens at the polls in election day. We we were talking about this uh, with uh, with David the other night uh, when we were out, but yeah, you know, I think you're bang on. So, that. so we're going to give some top line here to the voters. So, uh, drum roll. Do, 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 do. Um, so what? Uh, where where Polera has the race at uh, between uh, last Saturday and last night mm -hmm. is at forty three NDP, forty Conservative, twelve Green, and five for some other slash independent candidate. So that's um, still pretty close, pretty close. Mm -hmm. And when you factor in the turnout weight, that's, um, I think, where if we didn't have the turnout weight, it would be uh, tied or thereabouts. It'd be even tighter between the NDP and Conservatives because the NDP uh, do have a do have an edge with uh, likely voters. So, Given the um, timing of that, Mike, right? You were saying last Saturday to last night, right? That yeah, the, this, that's yeah. right. Do, do you do you infer something there? Because I think we're kind of um, we're switching from a slight advantage conservatives to slight advantage NDP. That that there was well, the, the, you're comparing yeah. apples and oranges a little bit uh, because uh, the other firms aren't using the turnout weight, right. as far as I can right. tell. Right. But um, I I don't think the events of this week have impacted the conservative vote so far. Of what I've seen, um, and. We'll come back next week, uh, middle of next week, with some updated numbers, and there will be a couple more. The way a rolling track works, for those who may not be familiar, is that you add the most recent day and you drop the oldest day in your in your moving sample. So as we move on a five-day track, we'll, as we add a couple more days before middle of next week, we will have dropped um, you know, the Saturday of last weekend and the Monday, and and that will give us um, you know, a, a fresher look at uh, how, what the trend line is, and uh, we'll see where where it goes. But it's still shaping up to be so far, pretty close election, and uh, we'll see how whether the parties are able to break free from each other in the next uh, seven days. Wow, I, this is yeah, this is uh, some pretty consistently tight numbers now, and just it's funny. I think to Corey's point, you know, in the opening, like to have BC churn what was supposed to be the sort of done deal election into something like this has been really fun to watch. Okay, question yeah. for the experts though. Yeah. How does a conservative campaign leadership team decide to try to get out the vote given that they only really came together as an organization provincially in the last right. five or six weeks? Like is that is that mm -hmm. an impossible hill to climb or do they just count on momentum? What happens in those conversations? Like I, my, my view, like from a, a province wide basis, it's, it's, it's got to be just sort of organic. Like, you know, I, I, I don't think there's enough time to actually set up the systems and uh, in place to actually run a, a, a modern, you know, voter identification, geo TV uh, program from, you know, coast to cut. Well, not, I guess from one end of the province to the other. Um, but I do think you can do it in swing seats, in in you know uh, a handful of ridings that you think are the most important. I think you actually have the ability to probably set something up there. But I think on on a province wide basis, like I think it's it's probably too too heavy a lift. And and I think that's something that 
is you know advantage NDP. You know, and I, I look at this very close race as 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 you know two two areas where the NDP has a, a significant and important advantage. And uh, and you talked about one in terms of uh, that your setup around the polling. Uh, I think that the demographics that are, uh, are are supporting the NDP right now are more likely to turn out to vote, and um, uh, and I think that's that's well, a big advantage. Well, there is and, a countervailing uh, issue there, which is it's not in the Polara poll, but it's um, in other polls where you ask certainty to vote, mm -hmm. how motivated are you to vote, and the Conservatives have pretty good passion behind it. Um, yeah, for among sure. Their, among their base, it's about the same as the NDP, but it's. Uh, you know, if, if if the younger people are, you know, when I say younger people, I'm going to probably say more like the 35 to 54 year olds. If they're if they're fired up to vote because they're really stressed by affordability, that will certainly help the conservatives. But oh, a hundred percent it will, Mike. And you know, but but this kind of comes down to like the, you know, I was going to actually ask you guys for for your prediction. What do you think voter turnout is going to be in this election campaign? Like, you know, in in Ontario, we were you know in the mid 40s in the last campaign. Uh, which is, uh, really? you know, lo lower than what you would normally expect in a provincial election. But when you're reelecting an incumbent, uh, lower voter turnout is normal, right? But, I, but when I you, when we'll you see, lot, I think we'll be a lot higher than last time because there was right. the, the so, COVID and everything. So that's that's advantage conservative, right? Like uh, high, yeah. higher voter turnout tends yeah. to to be bad news for for incumbents. Uh, it's a, it's a sign of a change election when that happens. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, where, where does, you know, GOTV and voter identification and all of that, you know, matter? Like, it, it probably moves the needle, in, in, in my view, you know, between one and three points. But, like, it's, 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 it's that small. Like, and it's important in very close races. But, uh, but it, it, it bends it only a little bit, right? You know, it, it's an important bend. It can take a you know a narrow loss into a narrow victory in in, in important ridings. Uh, but you know, the the far bigger thing is what's going on in the sort of tidal shift of voters. And and if it's a change election, you're going to see higher voter turnout. That's going to tend to benefit uh, the the opposition as opposed to the government. And and I think we're seeing some signs of that here. And so that higher level of you know engagement, you know, will shift uh you know who the likely voters are and and you know that's that's we'll probably the most important element I'm, hey. Corey, yeah go ahead well you have a question to go well go like I, I just while we had Corey, I, I kind of one of the things i was wondering from his standpoint just looking at going back to the the very sad morbid metaphors about the death of, of, of bc united um like one of the things that I think was a bit surprising to me was when the deal was struck, whatever it was, and sort of the question became who was who were the conservatives bringing on? The numbers were actually quite small, right? Like in terms of particularly incumbents, I think do we land at four or five? Like it wasn't many that went from BC United to the conservatives, and I would have thought that would be a more attractive proposition for the conservatives because you avoid you avoid a vote split in a space where you have an incumbent, and then you also those people just come with more of the machinery. Um, and the type, uh, the type of you know, the type of infrastructure that you're struggling with when you're such a yep. fresh new party. So, like, does that does that does that number strike you as low? Um, I, like, w was there an advantage? Maybe, uh, like, why would they have, why would they have kept it so low? Uh, I, I, maybe I have like a little bit different view as as somebody who is an outsider to this market, but. What strikes me when I, you know, come out and and, and chat with folks in, in, involved uh, here, they're all BC United, and um, you know, in term, terms of people involved in the, the BC insiders. Conservative, yeah, yeah, right. Like you know, and and what you've seen is is a change in the leadership group of those who are mm -hmm. running uh, the operation. You know, they they're they're you know younger. You know. Maybe let you know, and and was uh, I think uh, you know saying to you the other night, you know, kind of what what they lack in in experience, they you know they have an enthusiasm and sort of vigor right now, and there's there's um, <clears throat> you know, but but they're all coming from, uh, uh, you know, d depending on you know the amount of time, I guess maybe that's the difference, but 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 between you know a few weeks and a few months, and maybe in some cases a couple of years of 
uh, having been you know BC United or BC Liberals and now are BC Conservatives, but like they, they all, that's where they came from. <laughs> like, and so, you know, I, I would say 100, percent you know, virtually 100 percent of their organization are former BC United people. It's just you know how how long have they been there and uh, you know where were they in that in, in that organization? So I think I think a bunch of that has migrated and will continue to, but. But there are things that that you can't just migrate, yeah. you know, with somebody. And one of them is like a voter information management system. Right? <laughs> like yeah. the, these these things cost you know millions of dollars to to to, to create and to uh, populate with data. And uh, and you know, there's a historic element to them. So but just you know, quickly on the BC United BC Conservative dynamic, and we'll maybe cover this next yep. week. Is that yesterday, Jazz Joe Hall from CKNW dumped the BC United opposition research dossier into the mm. public realm. And uh, there's a lot there that, yeah. uh, and I, I'm, I'm wondering whether someone associated with the conservatives gave it to jazz just to blow it out the door instead of getting hit piece by piece on it. But I, I know that because Saturdays, I believe Saturday is the deadline for candidates. Yep. Um, and so it's point of no return now for these candidates being on the ballot and They'll go from there with that team. There's no, there's no, unless there's a dramatic uh, last minute uh, change in some writing, which I doubt. Uh, this is what we've got, and we'll see whether the opposition research narrative takes hold next week. Guess I want to talk to you today about public safety and how our sponsor, Fortis BC, works to keep communities safe during wildfire season. Some of the steps they take include application of fire suppression materials and fire blankets around infrastructure, clearing vegetation, and monitoring assets to maintain service for customers in the event sections of the Fortis BC energy system are damaged. The employees of Fortis BC live and work in the communities that they serve, so they too understand how wildfires impact families, homes, and businesses. Many Fortis BC staff involved in the 2023 West Kelowna wildfire response were personally affected, whether they were on an evacuation alert themselves or helping friends and family evacuate safely. As an energy provider, Fortis BC is just one piece of the puzzle when it comes to responding to wildfires. Coordinating with emergency officials, BC Wildfire Services, and other local agencies is critical to maintaining the safe and reliable energy British Columbians rely on. On behalf of our sponsor, Fortis BC, thank you to all of the crews, firefighters, emergency responders, and community members who work tirelessly to keep our communities safe during a busy wildfire season. Fortis BC, energy for a better BC and a better podcast. Okay, I'm gonna move us along because the producer landlords at Hotel Pacifico are gonna get pretty <laughs> angry if we don't go. And we can we can wrap up our, because we have our final segment. I'm, I'm gonna try and join the two. We have the espresso bar. Uh, and our topic of the day. And we were going to spend the topic of the day just talking about <clears throat> some of the Indigenous candidates uh, running right now, just in, in, mm. and, and, and the Indigenous vote more broadly in Indigenous issues as we turn our attention to Truth and Reconciliation Day on Monday. So <clears throat> I'll go around a bit. Actually, I'll start with you, Mike. Um, yeah. Are there any, yeah, any candidates in particular well, you're watching? I'll, I'll, yeah. uh, I'll, raise a, I'll raise a coffee to the First Nation candidates that are in, in the election and... Um, <clears throat> Certainly the NDP have the biggest roster of them, I believe at least six. Um, and, uh, and and some are many that may well get elected. And the, the record for First Nations candidates being elected in British Columbia is three in an election. That just happened like in 2017. And uh, so I'll raise my coffee to all those who are running. Uh, I'll also uh, raise a coffee to uh, Frank Calder, who served as a the first First Nation MLA in British Columbia, he served 26 or 30 years, mainly for the well, the CCF, the NDP, and at the very end, the social credit. And he was the Frank Calder of the Calder case that was the groundbreaking land title case that Nishka brought forward in the early late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, frankly, should be a statue of him at the legislature. And uh, so I just want to recognize the history, but recognize those who are on the ballot this time. Thanks. Jeff? Well, Calder, too, has his name on the foundational case, basically, of Indigenous yeah. rights entitled to just, uh, you know, judicial decisions and everything in Canada. But 
I'd like to put a pin in the topic and come back. I've got a few things to say, but I think we should circle back to this issue next week uh, after Reconciliation Day, because there's a lot to be said about it. But we just spent all this time discussing the opioid crisis, which is a clearly, you know, doesn't, it's in the polling, but not in the top three with housing. So it'll be a very clear distinguishing factor that people are going to look at that and they're going to assess that. I think the same is true for reconciliation because you have um, John Russell promising to tear up the legislation that he supported when he was a member of BC, uh, BC Liberal Caucus. And um, and you have a member of his, a uh, candidate of his in uh, Prince Rupert, uh, Chris Sankey, who is uh, Sim Shin. I might have mentioned Chris before. I can't remember. I've been on, yeah. We've been on the air so much <laughs> that I can't remember everything that happened. Uh, but he's saying, don't worry, um, he's on a lot, um, that giving his own perspective that actually UNDRIP and DREP is a good thing. And John Russ is not the guy that some people say that this is all going to be very good. Running against Tamara Davidson, who's also Haida, uh, uh, Chris is Haida Simpson, uh, good, ba strong background in uh, administrative uh, jobs in Haida Gwaii. She's a member of the Haida Nation. Uh, that's probably a safe NDP seat, but it's very interesting that now you have two Indigenous candidates facing off mm -hmm. against each other where that issue is going to be key. And I think there's a number around the province where we're going to see that. Uh, David Eby met with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs last week. Uh, there was some nice pictures out of it, not a formal endorsement, but I think that uh, we've had a party president now for a number of years, uh, Aaron Shumahetsa from Merritt, who was a candidate, now party president. So there's been a lot of positive work done on that side. And on the BC Liberal side, of course, Indigenous candidates, too, sorry, BC Conservative side, Indigenous candidates, but a completely different take on what needs to happen going forward. So interesting to see what happens there. Thanks, Jeff. Corey. Corey, what's your take uh, on Ellis Ross on the national scene? Oh, yeah. I, I think a very interesting candidate. Like, I, I you know, this is another area where I think BC is has really been... Uh, laying a, a, a pretty important foundation for the rest of the country and how to deal with issues related to reconciliation. Like, I, I, I think you've done it um, best and most effectively here compared to other places. And, and, and I say that around, in, you know, sort of equity deals in terms of resource development and, and things like that, where you're, you're truly partnering with First Nations in terms of, of the ownership uh, of, uh, of these kinds of projects. And, and you're seeing that you know, starting to happen elsewhere, you know, the, the ring of fire, which, uh, which some of your listeners may know what it is, but it's a big mining project in, in Northern Ontario. And, uh, uh, it's been very difficult. It's been going on for, you know, what, 15 years, something like that. Kate, you probably know better than I, um, but, uh, you know, uh, getting very close to having agreements in place to, to actually have the thing proceed. And, and, and it's, you know, it, uh, all of these things are it's, it's about including first nations in terms of the ownership and you know where they go from opponent to proponent uh because they have like a, a a financial upside in terms of seeing development and and i think that's what actually will in, in time lead to uh to to true self-government you got to have some version of a tax base in order to to, to do that and i think that's where the money is going to come from ultimately Thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah. But uh, in terms, I want to raise a glass. Okay. Uh, can, can I do that? Quickly. I want to raise a glass to you guys. Uh, uh, Hotel Pacifico, I, I am, you know, one of the many people across the country who tunes into you every week and now every day. And, uh, you know, the fact that you you had both party leaders, like, I don't think we could do that with the curse of politics. Like, no, no one's going to come on. Well, all three. Party all, three, leadership. Sure. <laughs> all, three. all three. All three. three. Yes. Yeah. Important to, to, to mention that. Uh, but you guys are doing an incredibly good job. We and, actually had uh, all four until uh, until, until the there four. wasn't four. <laughs> until there wasn't four. <laughs> until uh, until, you know, <laughs> until there was three. That yeah. incident. But but yeah. that's that's impressive. Like there, you know, you, you know, it'd be unusual for for like a mainstream uh, television network to have interviews of that length with uh, principles of a campaign during a campaign. So uh, hell yeah, cheers to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Corey. Uh, yeah, I'll very quickly just say I wanted to give a shout out to Res Dog Walkers. It's a podcast that covers a lot of Indigenous issues and Indigenous podcasts. Uh, I'm sorry, politics. I was going to say Mike, I think, has been on that. Da Dallas host. Smith, the host. Yeah. Very cool. So we'll I'll, I'll keep it tight. I'll keep it there. I'll thank uh, I want to thank you, Corey, for joining us today. It's so fun having you on. I love <laughs> I love your fire breathing. Uh, I love your suit. Like, no, no. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah. Thanks. For, thank you, Corey. And thanks, guests, for joining us for episode five of our daily election podcast. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, Talis, and our sponsors, Fortis BC and BC Dairy. Nope, we won't be back until Tuesday, but we will see you on Tuesday, guests. BC, you can never leave. Check out time at Hotel Pacifico. We hope you enjoyed your stay.